All right, welcome everyone. We'll get started in just a couple minutes. So let us finish getting situated and make sure we give everyone a few more minutes to join us. All right, welcome. Uh, my name is Bryce Knudsen. I'm the product manager for the healthcare uh, market and for environmental monitoring for Cetra Systems. Uh, we will uh, take questions through the questions pane uh, that you have in your little drop down there on the right hand side. Um, and so if you have any, just put them in there and we'll answer most of them at the end unless something is uh, especially uh, Applicable to the current slide. So first, I kind of already introduced myself um, as the product manager for critical environments and healthcare for Cetra. Uh, and the first question then is, what is this webinar about? Uh, this webinar is to one introduce you to Cetra if you're not already familiar with us, and then to discuss from a kind of a high level for the most part the applications for environmental monitoring products in healthcare, as well as you know, the products that Cetra provides to, uh, to uh, service that market. So here is a full agenda for the meeting today. Uh, first, we'll talk about who is Cetra, then we'll do an overview of the ventilization and pressurization in healthcare. We'll talk about common standards and accreditations. We'll go into some of the detailed requirements and best practices in the environmental monitoring space, go through a couple of examples. We'll talk about how to select the right monitor, and then we'll actually talk through the solutions that Cetra recommends and provides. Before we get started fully, I just want to note that the views and opinions expressed or implied during this are not the views or opinions of ASHRAE, ISO, or USP though we will discuss them and what the regulations say and what our interpretation is of them in the cases where that's necessary. So first, who is CETRA? Um, CETRA, it was founded in 1967 by two professors from MIT. Uh, we are now part of a larger uh, corporation called Fortive, which is a Fortune 500 company. Uh, we specialize in pressure and other sensing products for well over 30 years. Our real expertise is in capacitive sensing technology. Uh, we have a number of patents, uh, NASA utilizes us, and we have well over 3 million products installed worldwide, and that number goes up every day. Uh, we are based out of Boxborough, Massachusetts, here in the United States. Uh, we are about 200-ish employees between production, sales, engineering, and marketing. Uh, we do our own manufacturing as well, uh, and our facility here in Boxborough is about 100,000 square feet. Um, we also have um, a couple of facilities around, and we have recently, if you're unfamiliar with us, uh, merged with a sister company called Gem Sensors, which does has kind of a similar um, background as us as well. All right. So real quick, we're going to start off with our first poll. Um, you'll be able to answer this in the pane on the right. We're going to do two real quick. Uh, prior to this webinar, how familiar were you with Cetra Systems? Let's give everyone a minute to answer that. All right. Oh, 
I didn't actually share the poll with you guys, so we can just share the poll if you want to see that. So it looks like uh, a few people are very familiar with us. Uh, most of you have heard of us probably before, and a few are new. So uh, welcome to everybody. And then the second one is uh, is the is whether you have used our products. So let's do that one real fast as well. Just trying to get a better idea of who's on the call, so we know kind of you know where to dive deeper and maybe where not to. All right, looks like we have a really strong mix. Most of you have, and some of you have not. So we'll we'll be glad to introduce you to some new products potentially that you haven't seen before and to products that maybe, you know, would be helpful for you. All right, let's move on. All right, so before we jump into this, let's talk about what we mean when we say critical environments in healthcare. These are the high consequence, high risk spaces. Now, when we talk about healthcare, pretty much every space falls into this category, but these are the ones that even relative to the others are the highest risk and the highest consequence. For example, operating rooms, isolation and treatment spaces where either you maybe have an infectious disease or you have a cancer patient who needs a protective environment. And then compounding pharmacies. You know, in compounding pharmacies, you need to make sure that you're not contaminating any of the products. So why do we concentrate on ventilation and pressurization in healthcare? We kind of touched on that in the last slide, but the big ones are infection prevention. As I noted, you know, if you have a case where you know that there's an infectious disease, safety of patients, caregivers, and hospital staff, this goes both directions, right? This is the people in the hall when there's a person with an infectious disease in a room, or it's the person in the room that is very ill and needs to be protected from things that could be in the hospital. Eliminating contaminants, for example, in the compounding pharmacy we mentioned, uh, patient and staff comfort, obviously that's common. We all understand that. You know, we do that in our own homes and everywhere else as well. And then there's accreditation, which, you know, in many cases, and especially in the U.S., means that you can get Medicare reimbursement. So at the end of the day, some of this actually comes down to dollars and cents. So how do we do this? We do this by monitoring and managing the, all of the environmental conditions, pressure relationships, temperature, humidity, air changes, and filtration. Now, we're gonna concentrate a lot in this webinar on pressure relationships. Uh, not to say the others aren't important, but we're gonna concentrate on that because that's one of the ones that is sometimes the most discussed or at, people have the least experience with. So some common standards and accreditations. Uh, so these are what we're gonna base most of our discussion today on. So the first is ASHRAE standard 170. Its actual topic is ventilation of healthcare facilities. This will be the primary uh, standard that we concentrate on. The Facilities Guidelines Institute is another, and what they do is they provide, as they say, guidelines on how to implement and execute on things like ASHRAE standard 170. We'll talk about USP 797 and 800. These are related to pharmaceutical compounding. So 797 is for non-hazardous sterile spaces and 800 is for hazardous sterile spaces. And then there's GMP and CGMP, which generally doesn't apply always to hospitals, but sometimes on occasion, there is an FDA approval required because maybe a hospital's compounding pharmacy provides a medications to a neighboring uh, hospital. If it leaves the building, then they have to have additional accreditations for that. And sometimes they have it even internally. So now accreditation and licensing, we've mentioned, you know, GMP and CGMP, so that usually relates to FDA approvals. Um, Joint Commission International is the primary accreditor for healthcare. Uh, mostly hospitals, there are some related around ambulatory sur surgery centers, uh, but they are actually generally accrediting towards the same standards, ASHRAE 170 and FGI. So ASHRAE 170 being the primary topic of this uh, webinar, I uh, wanted to point out some significant changes that happened in the last few years. So in 2017, 
they split this document into three sections. It used to be a single section that talked about ventilation in healthcare and the spaces in healthcare. And they created three sections that actually were identical, inpatient care, outpatient, and residential living. Now, this was intended to, get, to correlate with the Facilities Guidelines Institute who had done the same thing. In 2021, they actually updated the tables and created fully new tables for the outpatient and residential living ventilation tables. So this addressed things like urgent care, surgery centers, long-term care, senior, senior living facilities. Um, they also added some filtration requirements. So there's now MERV ratings for each of the spaces. They've added improved guidance on space ventilation for anesthetic gas use. They clarified the class one, two, and three, and now coordinate and fall in line with FGI. And then there are two pandemic related items. One, in 2021, they now allow isolation spaces to exhaust into general exhaust if they're HEPA filtered. So that was big because before they always had to be out to outside. Potential additions that they're still talking about is how to manage the requirements around surge care. Um, spaces. This is, you know, when you put up a temporary isolation space for pandemic response. Let's jump into some of the actual details of these standards. So this is actually a summary of the standards kind of combined, mostly ASHRAE 170 and USP 797 and 800. Uh, you can see here that the primary things are pressure, temp humidity, and air changes per hour. The key thing that we want to point out is some spaces require you to have constant pressure monitoring. This means in those spaces that on site you have to have a monitor showing the pressure locally for that space at the room, at the space itself. A special one to note is operating theaters are kind of unique. They actually are listed as a best practice but it is such a best practice at this point that it's nearly required. It is rare to see a operating room that is not constantly monitored. Um, you do not necessarily have to have local monitoring for temp and humidity, but you do for pressurization because this manages contaminants and infection um, more so even than the temp and humidity portions do. Now you can note here too, operating theaters have very high air changes per hour. Um, that's an, always important to make sure that if there are contaminants coming into the air, they're getting cleared out very quickly. Um, another thing that I'll note is we have here ante rooms specified. Ante rooms have very similar requirements to the room that they're actually protecting, right? So you have an ante room and then an isolation space. So each room to the adjacent space has to have a pressure differential. We'll talk through that in the applications. Now we just talked about what are considered critical spaces. And you know, in the hospital, it can be argued that there's no such thing as a non-critical space. But in, in a relative sense, there is a, some spaces that we kind of think of as non-critical. And these are often spaces that we sometimes forget should be monitored or we should be maintaining uh, pressure here. And we are seeing that joint commission is actually concentrating on these more, especially like these dirty linen and clean linen storage, making sure when they do their inspections that they verify that those are actually all inspect. So what you see here are sort of like these secondary spaces, emergency department, like I said, clean, dirty linens, bronchoscopy, morgue and autopsy. Obviously monitoring these all is, is best practice, um, but it's not actually required. And some of these just have to have a positive or negative relationship, but they don't have a minimum differential requirement. And it should be noted, this is not even close to an exhaustive list of the non-critical spaces. The non-critical spaces that don't require like constant monitoring is over a hundred spaces long when you actually get deep into the, the specification. Uh, so we do have another poll question here. Uh, in your facility or experience, how do you monitor secondary, non-critical spaces for pressure relationships? That should show up in your slide in the screen there.
All right, thank you. So we actually have quite a spread on this one um, with 9% doing manual measurements, 23% uh, using something similar to a ball on the wall or other non-connected device, 36% uh, doing continuous monitoring solutions that are connected to a VAS, and another third is actually not doing this at all. Um, so we'll talk through one of the products we have that we think applies really well in this space in, in a couple minutes. All right, so let's talk through some applications. So this here is a standard isolation space for, let's say you had a TB or a COVID patient. So here we have a monitor on the outside displaying all the conditions in the room, including pressure. We have a air velocity wand and a temp and humidity sensor. Obviously in this case, uh, to maintain the room pressure, we have a supply and an exhaust that differ by about 100 CFM with the larger, larger being on the exhaust to create a negative room space. This here is actually a more advanced solution to this problem where we also have an anteroom. So what's important to note here is your anteroom has to be at least, as the there was a previous slide about this, whoop, let me just go over place, 0.01 inches of water column negative to the corridor. And then each of the rooms has to be 0.01 to the anteroom. We're showing 0.02 here, but the actual requirement is 0.01. Um, but this is a common level to maintain. So in this case here, what's actually happening is we're using four of the Cetra light products and a standard Cetra 264 pressure transducer reporting into a Cetra Flex monitor that can then display all of the data from all of those monitors that are outside the room so that everyone outside knows that it's safe to be in the area. So here we have a protective environment. Like we said, if you have a, a comp compromised patient, then you can have a space that's positively pressurized to keep things out. It's the exact same thing as an isolation room, but with the exhaust and supply switched. Operating theaters uh, do have a little bit of a difference. Um, we see usually more higher accuracy temperature and humidity sensors. We usually see a second entryway, so like a scrub room, and then like a main hall door. So you have to maintain both of those pressures. And in this case, we're using a Cetra light that's reporting into this Cetra flex. And then the Cetra flex can report both the pressure between the corridor and the space and the scrub room and the space. Um, this also shows a particle counter here, which is something that is becoming a little more common. We definitely see it a lot more um, in the Middle East and Europe, but it does appear to be, uh, be trending in the direction of, of more common to verify that you don't have a bunch of particulate matter in the air in your space. Um, compounding pharmacy is probably one of the most advanced applications you usually see in a hospital. Um, this is actually a pretty simple non-hazardous application. So in this case, we have particle counters to make sure we don't have particulate count, um, contaminants in the air. We do have two, an anteroom and a main space. These are both positively pressurized to their adjacent outward spaces to make sure that nothing is coming in and contaminating the, the pharmaceuticals that are being manufactured. And again, in this space, we can display everything on one of the Cetra Flex monitors outside the space. All right, question number four. How many compounding pharmacies do you have in your facility? Should be able to see that poll now on your screen. So it looks like we have mostly spaces with none, which actually isn't necessarily uncommon. Um, quite a few, about 35% with one or two, and then it looks like one or two people that actually have more than two. Um, you know, this is not an uncommon spread because 
usually an actual compounding pharmacy is found in much, much larger facilities, and usually ones that have specialty care um, facilities as well. All right, so now that we've talked through applications, we've talked through what are critical spaces, what are the general guidelines, um, let's talk about how to choose the right room model. So first is to understand if it's critical or non-critical, right? Is it in that operating room space or an ISO space, or is it a you know, clean linen closet? Uh, do you need a monitor for a single room or multiple? Do you have an ante room or a scrub room, or are you doing an even more complex compounding pharmacy with both hazardous and non-hazardous spaces, so you have three or four spaces? Will the pressure monitor also be used to monitor other parameters? Is ACH critical to the space's effectivity? So if you are gonna evaluate ACH on the monitor or temp and humidity, they need to make sure you choose a proper that can actually manage those parameters. Not all monitors can. Do the end users prefer to have an audible alarm for out of tolerance spaces? Now, to be clear, we didn't talk about this, but critical spaces have to have an audible alarm that's available. But many spaces don't have to have the audible alarm, but they may prefer it. Does the customer require 21 CFR Part 11 compliance? Now, this would only apply if you know they're doing actual manufacturing of some type in their compounding pharmacy. And then future proofing. Are there future parameters that are not required to be monitored yet, i.e. filter status? That's not something that's asked, but filters being identified now in the ASHRAE 170 guideline is it has changed kind of the dynamic there a little bit. Also, Filter status might just be something that you want to be able to address more effectively. All right, so now we know what to think about, and now we can talk about what solution Cetra provides. So we provide basically an entire gamut, almost all the products required for doing this. So we provide standard low pr differential pressure sensors. So these can go in the ceiling, they can go, they can do duct pressure differentials. We do humidity and temp sensors, both low and high accuracy. We have particle count, a full range of particle counters, and we also have a velocity sensor. But the main thing we do provide is room and environmental monitors, both which we'll talk about in more detail. And we do provide a remote monitoring and compliance system, which is like a cloud platform uh, that you can basically trend all of this data in and can output reports for you and everything to maintain compliance within your facility. So monitors. So we have four main monitors in our product line. The first was released in 08, the SRPM. All of these are still available. Um, that's a single room pressure monitor with back net or analog outputs. It has visual and audible alarms. So it meets all the requirements for your critical environments. All of these actually meet the minimum requirements for your critical environments, but we do recommend some over others. Um, in 2012, we released a monitor that can do two rooms and can do additional parameters, temp, humidity, and it also has back net and analog, and it does support third-party products. And then we released the Flex, which is probably what we would consider our flagship product. It has the ability to manage three different rooms and 18 parameters total. You can feed any parameter to this that you can bring over the back net connection to it. Um, it has back net MSTP or back net IP, and it does still maintain both visual and alarms and the third-party products. Lastly, we recently released the Cetra Light. I say recently, but it was 2020. And this is just a fresher only one room analog output. This is a cost-effective solution for, well, any application you have, but especially for those secondary non-critical spaces. Um, we actually had a customer inform us that they had a JC inspection and they have these installed on all of those secondary spaces. And the JC inspector came in and starts going down the halls, looking at every single one. And after they get through like the first floor, he asked them, are they all like this? And they said, yes. And it turned that inspection into a glance down the hallway because you can see these all the way down the hallway as long as you're within line of sight. And it greatly reduced their time to manage those rooms and make sure that they're pressurized properly and their inspections. So the other product I noted there that we'll talk about a little bit deeper um, was the SEMS platform. So SEMS is basically a cloud product where you have a hub that you can bring all the data into. It can come in from your um, 
BAS or it can be brought in from our products individually. And then you can trend all the data for different parameters, different spaces. Uh, it has built-in uh, products for reporting for 21 CFR Part 11, ISO 14644, FDA, CGMP. And it can be it's compatible with all of our products and many, many third-party products, most third-party products. Um, there's a lot of customizable dashboards and everything as well. All right, this is the last poll, so bear with me. Uh, so when choosing a pressure monitor, what communication protocol do you utilize slash prefer? Let's give everyone one more minute on that. There's a couple more seconds. All right. So I'll share that with you. Um, so it looks like, as I probably expected, was BACnet, MSTP, and IP are the leaders uh, with a small amount of analog and a few that are not connected. And then other not listed, which um, if anyone wants to comment in the chat what those other not listed would be, that would be very interesting, I think, to myself and probably to many others. All right. All right, so um, we're kind of going to wrap up here. The last couple of slides are kind of a recap of what we've talked about. Um, so when we're talking about the Cetra solutions for, prep, for environmental and room pressure monitoring, um, here's kind of what we recommend by application. So you can see here for um, isolation and protective environments, a flex monitor with a temp and humidity and a velocity sensor. You could also swap in a central light here as well if you're looking for a more cost-effective solution. Um, operating theaters, again, the full gambit, and because you usually want to have all the extra parameters, a flex is the, the best solution here. Compounding pharmacies are kind of similar to the operating theater in that there's a lot of other parameters that you often want to, to manage and keep track of. So we recommend a flex, and then since you're going to have anti-rooms, we suggest light. And then the bottom here, we know, you know, if you do need compliance for that compounding pharmacy, something along GMP, for GMP or FDA approval, um, the SEMS platform is very, very helpful here. And then we just note here that anti-rooms and non-critical spaces, the light is definitely the best, uh, one of the best applications there, very cost effective. And then if you do need to have temp and humidity in your non-critical spaces, the SRH product is, is very effective there. So what's next? You know, first thing to do is review your projects for regulated critical and non-critical spaces while you're, as you're designing. Um, evaluate the customer requirements, like we talked about before, categorize the spaces, understand if the customer has a preferred monitor, determine if that monitor actually needs the space's needs, define any expandability that they may want, and then obviously you need to make sure if they have any compliance requirements. Uh, obviously, I'm probably preaching to the choir here, and this is all stuff you know, but I just want to recap on exactly how to go about that. Um, and then discuss monitoring preferences with your BAS partners, or if you are a BAS partner, discuss those monitoring preferences with your with your uh, design engineering team. Um, usually, you know, your BAS partner has used these the most and has the most experience, so they're a good uh, good resource for that. We're also happy to help. Develop standardized guide specs for environmental and pressure monitors. So we, if you're interested, we do provide guide specs for our flex and um, light monitors, and we can help you with that. And then as required, make sure you educate customers on your monitoring solutions. Um, I can't, I've been on so many site visits where a nurse pulls me aside and says, what is that? And, you know, that to me means that we are not communicating well enough to them uh, about the tools that they have at their disposal. And we've done, you know, ad hoc presentations to them in, in the hallway. And so, you know, being able to educate your customer is very helpful and getting to the end user is often just uh, the best way to, to figure out what works best for them and what they need. 
And with that, we will open questions. Uh, there should be a questions pane in your bottom, in your uh, dashboard there. And we'll give everyone a couple minutes and I'll do my best to answer them all within the time limit we have allotted, which is till about 4.30. All right, we have our first question. In clean room applications, some customers request stainless steel pressure sensors. Are the sensors all plastic? So we do not have at the, well, we have an older model product that does come stainless that you can do pressure uh, sensing with, the SRIM model. It is available on our website. It, we do not have a current version that is stainless at the moment, but I will add that to my list and I will put a check bar box next to my list of requests from customers for stainless monitors. I will note that um, our monitors do have, we do have, I've done a lot of testing with different cleaning agents and uh, they're IP54 or 65 rated, depending upon the model. So they do actually quite well in these environments. There's no way that's the only question after all that, all that. I know I didn't go that deep on everything. I will make one additional comment on that previous question. Our actual transducer internally is uh, a stainless transducer, but I, I believe you're asking about the entire product. Is there a calibration requirement on pressure um, uh, pressure monitors. So that depends on the pressure monitor. The Cetra monitors have a very, very, very low drip spec. And what we recommend is a yearly zeroing. So on our monitors, they all have the ability to be zeroed locally. So you can, there's a you know very easy, simple procedure you can do on monitor and make sure that the zero is properly set. And if you do that, the monitors stay within spec for a generally, we do not define the specific amount of time. Now, some vendors, I have seen a few that say, you know, you have to recal these every year. Um, and then that this goes a little further because there are some regulatory things in like the GMP space where often people write specifications for their business that say, you have to do it every six months. Well, those aren't always based on the recommendation of the vendor, but that, that will come into play sometimes. So with our monitors though, um, some of them you can actually calibrate on the wall. Um, so we can do both the flex and the SRPM can be calibrated in place. The others would have to be sent back. Uh, from Dennis, do any of the monitors have data logging and export data capability? So, no, we currently do not have data logging and export data capability on the monitors themselves. Um, if you did the SEMS platform, obviously, you know, connecting them to that would be able to allow you to export data to anything you wanted and would provide full data logging via the cloud. So what is the lowest pressure difference you can effectively measure? Um, well, so that's a great question from Robert. Um, we sell pressure transducers that go, and monitors that go as low as a range of plus or minus 0.05. The way that they are set, um, identified for accuracy, we actually can measure within 0 0.00, about one slash two, depending upon the sensor. So on the 0.05 monitor, 
it'll be at like plus or minus 0 0.001 half, I think is what the exact number comes out to. So we can actually measure that difference. So in the case of, for example, in this space, we're usually trying to maintain at minimum 0 0.01, Differential, we can do, you know, a tenth or better of that most of the time. And I, I give you the 0 0.0015 as the, the published spec because we often are successful at doing better than that. But that is the, the guaranteed spec. All right, any other questions? All right, if there's no others, I guess we can, uh, and this early, I'll just give one. Oh, you mentioned that the flex can monitor 18 parameters in three rooms. What parameters are necessary to be measured? Uh, that was from Adam Wright. So, in that, on the flex, the parameters that are necessary to be monitored are a little bit dependent upon the space and the customer's requirement. Um, the required one to be locally monitored if you're not doing it via your BAS or BMS is pressure in most cases. Many spaces like operating rooms and compounding pharmacies require temp and humidity as well to be measured. Now, some spaces take that a step further and believe that air changes per hour is critical since it's a requirement um, in ASHRAE and because it has a significant impact on uh, their infection control and contamination in the clean room. So in that case, you now are at four per space, and you can add additional things like particle count as well, which is always a good one to have as well if you're doing something like compounding. So there are probably some extras there that aren't always used, uh, but you know that's what was uh, we were able to provide in that monitor, and we do see it happen now and then. The other thing we see sometimes is people will use that to the flex to display like pressure for kind of like a nurse's station. So they add six pressures for six different rooms or a pressure and temperature for a room and a pressure and temperature and a pressure and temperature. Any others? Last chance, any last minute, any last questions? All right, I think I answered all the questions. Um, thank you for participating and especially participating in the polls that we did. Um, if you have any questions, you can reach out to myself and I can either help you with your questions or I can direct you to your regional sales manager who can help you with any quoting or product needs. They can often come out and help you with application definition. Um, one thing we do find helpful often is uh, we have customers that will send us their design drawing for the space and say, hey, what do you recommend for uh, environmental monitoring? And we have most of our RSMs are very good at that. So. Feel free to reach out to them or reach out to me and we can get you connected with the right people. Also happy to answer any other questions you come up with after this. Uh, I don't have my email up here, but it's bryce.newtson 
B-R-Y-C-E dot K-N-U-D-S-O-N at cetera.com. All right. Thank you again. Have a great day.